Henry the Fourth, Part Two, unlike any other of his plays, truly shows Shakespeare as a working professional. Not only did he produce a sequel, Hollywood sequel, but he also produced a spin-off of the Henry IV series called The Merry Wives of Windsor, which also stars Falstaff. Now, this is truly a Hollywood sequel in the sense that the crowd wanted more, he gave them more Falstaff, he also likes sequels. Look at the new Star Wars films. He rewrites scenes from Henry IV, Part I, thinking more. Uh, not only are we back in East Cheap in the same tavern, but we're now getting not just one Falstaff type character, but two with the introduction of Ancient Pistol. Now, Unlike a Hollywood sequel, there's also some very unique features in Henry IV Part II. And one of them is the use of allegorical figures. Now let's look at the opening of the play, what is called an induction, not a prologue like we see in Romeo and Juliet or even in Henry V, the next play in the Henry ad. An induction is a kind of reasoning from particular cases leading to a general proof, the opposite of a deduction. So you start from the parts, which leads you to the whole. But who is presenting this induction? The allegorical figure of Rumor. Enter rumor painted full of tongue. That means Henry the Fourth, Part Two, begins with a figure from the medieval morality plays. And if you go to one of the other playlists on this channel, you'll notice we talk about one of them, Every Man. Now we've already noted that Falstaff was called vice, he was called iniquity, he was called ruffian, he was called vanity. These are all allegorical figures. You can even think of Hotspur as a kind of allegorical figure for, for rash action. When you look at the character lists of the plays, if you look at those character lists, it's like we're looking at a medieval morality play. You get the county justices who make up some very comical scenes with Falstaff. Shallow, who relives the good old days with Falstaff. And Silence, plus some of the country soldiers that are mustered deceitfully by Falstaff. Moldy, Shadow, Wart, Feeble, Bullcalf, in the Tavern in East Cheap, you get Ancient Pistol, which is kind of a funny name because uh, he obviously is in need of some Viagra. He's all talk, no shot, no vigor. As well as Quickly, Dalter Sheet, and the two sergeants Fang and Snare. And of course, you also have Will. Finally, to round out these medieval influences, not only do we get Chaucer's frenemy, John Gower, as a character, but we also see how the Lord Chief Justice, by the fifth act, just becomes the allegorical figure of justice. So the play opens on Rumor. And Rumor is a grotesque figure with painted tongues, if you remember. And he's used to recap the previous episode of this Henry ad, but he recounts it in a menacing sort of way. All of you readers and audience are implicated in the desire to encounter this allegorical figure. You all want to hear from him. Open your ears for which of you will stop the venting of hearing when loud rumor speaks.
Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace while covert enmity concealed enemies under the smile of safety wounds the world. You can't help but think of the smiling king and also the willingness of the fickle crowd, which makes a huge appearance in Julius Caesar. But think about how Henry cultivated the crowd leading to Richard's fall in the commons. As for military buildups, those rumors we hear in Hamlet, those are the whispers for willing ears rumor the allegorical figure has uttered. And who but rumor, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepared defense while the big year swollen with some other grief is thought with child by the stern tyrant war that's another allegorical figure war appears as part of the rumor i like how rumor becomes a musical instrument a kind of flute or pipe played by the people rumor is a pipe blown by surmises jealousies conjectures and of so easy and so plain a stop that's the openings in a pipe that you play that the blunt monster with uncounted heads the still discordant wavering multitude can play upon it in other words the people can play upon the pipe of rumor again think of henry the fourth and richard and the commons finally notice how rumor is also described as a kind of hydra a monster with uncounted heads monsters fill this play the archbishop is described as being in a monstrous form uh, an iron man the three fronts of henry the fourth's new war are described as hydra and finally don't forget the ending of henry the fourth part one when Glendower is utterly confused by all of the kings springing up like heads in front of him. We can't find the real Henry IV to kill. But rumor wonders why he should be truthful. That's not the nature of rumors. Instead, he decides to tell a lie. But what mean I to speak so true at first? Why am I going to tell the truth? My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth, Hal, fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword. You see how terrible rumor can be. From rumor's tongues, they bring smooth comforts, false, worse than true wrongs. In other words, the play will begin with a lie and with confusion when the sick Northumberland becomes filled with joy that his son has won against all odds and taken Hal prisoner, like he always does. But he's totally wrong. Rumors can be deadly. You remember in Richard II how the Welsh hear rumors that Richard was killed and leave the coast. That rumor that shocks Northumberland in the end results in more revenge and more rounds of rebellions, which include the Archbishop of York, Mowbray's son, and other lords. Now, rumor also reminds us of another allegorical figure, hope. And it's the reason why Hotspur loses at Shrewsbury. Archbishop, who's the Iron Man. Tis very true, Lord Bardoff, for indeed it was young Hotspur's cause at Shrewsbury, Lord Bardoff. It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope. He strengthened himself with hope, eating the air and promise of supply of military logistics, flattering himself in project of a power Right? He was ex expecting uh, an army much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts. And so with great imagination, proper to madmen, led his powers to death and winking leaped into destruction. This should remind you of Henry V's prologue about imagination. How through words you can create whole armies. In this case, Hotspur 
heard words and created armies. Hastings. But by your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope, Lord Bardoff. We fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of a house beyond his power to build it. This is a reference to Geoffrey of Vansaw found in Chaucer about the planning of a composition. Is Shakespeare thinking that in the creation of his Henriad is going beyond his powers to compose it? When Falstaff is given the responsibilities of mustering troops, who does he muster? Do you remember this in Henry the Fourth, Part One? He goes about looking for homeless people because the best of society will pay their way out of service. Mustering troops is a way for Falstaff to make money. Such as indeed were never soldiers, but discarded, unjust, or dishonest serving men, younger sons to younger brothers, revolted or runaway tapsters and ostlers, trade fallen or out of work. The kinkers of a calm world and a long peace, ten times more dishonorable, ragged than any old feast ensign or a tattered flag. And such have I to fill up the rooms of them as I've bought out their services. He has to fill up the pages of the muster books for those who with money buy themselves out of service. That you would think that I had a hundred and fifty tattered prodigals lately come from swine keeping, from eating draft and husks. A mad fellow met me on the way and told me I had unloaded all the gibbets. He'd, he'd basically found all the executed gallows and pressed the dead bodies. In other words, his army is just terrible looking. No eye hath seen such scarecrows. For indeed, I had the most of them out of prison. There is not a shirt and a half in all my company. And the half shirt is two napkins tacked together and thrown over the shoulders like a herald's coat without sleeves. I mean, they look ragged. And the shirt, to say the truth, stolen from my host at St. Albans or the red-nosed innkeeper of Deventry. But that's all one. They'll find linen enough on every hedge. In other words, they'll still close as they walk. This is why Hal is concerned about Falstaff the prince disturbed at what he sees. But tell me, Jack, whose fellows are these that come after? Mine, Hal, mine. I did never see such pitiful rascals. Tut, tut, good enough to toss. Food for powder. This is cannon fodder. Food for powder. They'll fit a pit, you know, a grave, as well as better. Tush man, mortal men, mortal men. Now, recognizing comedy gold, Shakespeare decides to actually develop a scene showing how Falstaff essentially sends uh, poorly trained uh, soldiers into battle, expecting them to be killed for the cash that he'll receive. And Shakespeare does it by playing with allegory. Shallow, mustering troops. Do you like him, Sir John? Shadow will serve for summer. Prick him, put him in the book for we have a number of shadows fill up the muster book. Falstaff is bad. He needs to fill in names for all the yeomen who have declined to fight. So what do you do if your army is filled out with shadows? Just names. Falstaff is a liar in that way. And remember, not only does he lie and probably about killing Hotspur, but he also extols in the virtues of lying. The most famous line from the Henriad is the better part of valor is discretion. In other words, the better part of being heroic is being prudent and heedful of potential consequences. It's very funny. It makes Falstaff a comedic character, but there's also a dark side to him as well. In the next episode, we're gonna look at Hal's usurpation of his father. Alright guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.